Hi everybody, welcome to the Turian Shepherd podcast where we talk all things adventure games. In today's episode, I will be chatting with Lucy Dreaming developer Tom Hardwidge of Tall Story Games. We'll be talking a little bit about his upcoming point-and-click adventure game Lucy Dreaming, some bits and pieces about game dev and adventure game engines, a little bit about marketing for video games, and of course we'll be touching on the wider adventure game community as well, and Monkey Island. We couldn't go without that one, could we? Now just quickly before we begin, I want to say a big thank you to my patrons Arcades Games, Wayne, Nate, Terminally Nerdy, Paul from the Phantom Fellows, and Lyle for their continued support that helps me keep making these videos and I'm going to be trying a new format in this one as well so feel free to let me know what you think about it down in the comments below this video. Hope you all enjoy. Yeah yeah of course well it's probably no better place to start than Lucy Dreaming is there so I guess the first thing people want to know really is where are you up to in terms of development and a potential maybe rough idea of when it could come out. Oh you can't ask me that I don't I don't know. (laughs) Uh, oh yeah. It, so in terms of the um, the dev of the full game and where it's up to, um, at, as we speak, it is. I would say it's hard. It's hard to gauge. I'd say it's it's it's, it's around sixty to seventy percent done. Okay. Um, it's quite hard to quantify that because the, uh, because I'm doing all of it. So I'm I'm a solo indie dev so i am doing all the artwork i'm doing all the programming i'm doing all the writing um and and that just kind of the whole lot apart from anything kind of audio although my wife (laughs) emma is doing the voice uh for the main character as well so we've kind of got that that to sort of deal with as well um but because i'm doing all of that i've i've drawn a lot of the the scenes already and i think there's there's going to be almost kind of 50 different scenes in the game and a lot of those have already been drawn so although i'm i'm sort of the first the first kind of half half of the game development time took took a long time to kind of get to this stage now the, the sort of the next stages of the development should come together a bit quicker because i don't have to kind of draw all the scenes as I'm going along as well. There's still some more to draw, but kind of a lot of that has already been done. So I'm hoping that the the kind of the last sort of 30 to 40 percent of the of the game that needs to be produced is, is, is going to kind of come together a lot quicker. Um, in terms of potential release date, I've kept that intentionally vague. It's our it's our first um, kind of full commercial game. Yep. So I don't want to over promise and then under deliver in terms of when, and I think most people would probably prefer a game that is well tested and well produced than kind of rushed because I over promised and decided I was going to cut six months out of my um, of my deadline just for fun. Um, so I've sort of said this summer it's probably going to be towards the tail end of it. It's probably going to be more like late August, September. Okay. Um, time, if it, if if you know disaster strikes and all my backups fail and I end up, you know, I who knows? There's always you know there's always going to be um, you know a bit of an unknown in there. But that's I, I'm I'm still on on track and on schedule for hitting kind of summer, uh, yep. and that's that's where that's what I'm aiming for. Okay, yeah. So you mentioned there about the um, the artwork and things being. Near, near enough done um you do some sort of live streams don't you like game development streams where you actually put together some of the, the artwork in front of people yeah i started um i started streaming actually i started kind of recording time lapse videos yeah. uh, a while ago um i did um uh, a game jam back in november 2020 and i did a couple of uh, time lapse recordings for that and after i'd done that um, I sort of every time I, if I remembered, I'd kind of set that software going while I, while I was kind of doing stuff in uh, in Photoshop and drawing drawing the artwork. Yeah. Um, and had that had that for going kind of for a few months, and then I can't remember why I decided to have a go at streaming. I think somebody some other people were doing it and it looked cool, and I thought, yeah. oh, go on, I'll have a go at doing that. Um, so I I'm trying to do. A, a stream at least one stream a month trying to maybe do 
two or three if I can. It depends on what, what needs to be done. So I've got a couple of scenes lined up, one of which is kind of half finished. I did the stream where I kind of got half of it done. And I've got to do the other half of that. Um, and then I've got another sort of two or three scenes which are in place in the game. I've got kind of placeholders in there and like little smiley faces for characters and all the dialogues in there and all the hotspots are in there, but I just need to right. draw it. Um, so I've got those I've got those to do as well. So yeah, no, it's it's really good fun having um, having the, the pixel art streams because people can kind of come in and ask questions and kind of go, are you still using a really old crappy mouse? And like, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's rubbish. Um, and you know what's you know what software are you using and they say you know and I'll, I'll kind of take the time to if somebody asks me a kind of technical question about something how the software works or something like that i can kind of say oh well you go into here and you change this setting and you, you know like use these layers or whatever it is um and i'm quite happy to kind of talk about that and also if people can offer suggestions as well so if i'm there going hey well i've drawn like a shelf in here but you know it's kind of it's a bit fluid anything could go on there what what should we put on there uh, then uh, people can kind of offer suggestions and go, oh, well, I think you should put this in, or I always thought it was funny if you could do this or that, and, and it can kind of go, yeah, that's a good idea. That's quite nice with character development as well. If I've got a kind of a rough idea of what a character needs to be, but there are a few, there's always a few things that are up for grabs, so people can kind of say, hey, wouldn't it be really funny if they had this on their head, or, you know, they had, you yeah, know, wearing course, a yeah. funny hat or had a moustache or something, then we can kind of... Um, kind of involve people and kind of collaborate and that's always that's always good fun yeah something that i've noticed actually as well is that a lot of the developers in the adventure game community seem to be quite helpful towards each other they're not afraid to get involved with each other's projects and give a bit of advice and and help if, if they need it yeah absolutely it's a really it's a really supportive and creative um community everyone's always happy to kind of help out and offer it like i said offer advice and um, collaborate on things as well so it's no it's it's a really just lovely lovely people all, yeah. all adventure game devs just seem to be really nice <laughs> yeah yeah so i've is. noticed as well i've actually got a couple of questions later which some other developers have asked me to ask you oh right oh right, oh, God, well, God, so right okay. <laughs> requests and things like that. <laughs> um but i mean in terms of game development what actually made you take that plunge into giving it a go like what was the the main trigger for you that you thought right i'm gonna give it a go i'm gonna try and create my own game so i've over the over my many decades of existence i have dabbled with little bits of game development so i think when i when i was about eight or nine um we got a a, a really old Kind of, well, it wasn't really old at the time. It was brand new. Um, we got a got a PC, uh, and it had uh, it was something called GW Basic, which was sort of you could essentially just do kind of basic kind of logic things. And I remember my my dad had obviously got a, a book of how to program GW Basic and just gen, you know sort of fairly basic kind of you know if statements and, and, yeah. and things like that. Uh, and we kind of started putting together a little text adventure game. Okay. And I think we did two scenes, and then I got bored, and just kind of, it's like, I was eight, it was like, I don't, you know, I'm going to go, and, I'm going to go, and, you know, go outside and climb a tree or something. Um, so, I kind of, I, I, but I never forgot that, and I always, I always kind of love, I always wished I'd done more. And then I got into, um, I got hold of a copy of um, Flash, my, uh, my brother, is a, a tech journalist and he got hold of a copy of flash four i think it was <laughs> um when i first started university so i mean this is this is 20 odd years ago and more than that and i was kind of playing about with logic in that and i i again I, one of my first thoughts i really want to have a go at making a point and click adventure game so i kind of started trying to program that and it just it failed i didn't really know i didn't know do what know what i was doing um then i kind of got a job in advertising after university at work started working at an advertising agency in london um again using flash because we used to do a lot of online advertising like banner ads okay but we would try to do make them as interactive as possible so putting little mini games and things inside these kind of banner ads that would kind of pop up and you had to fit them in something like 12k or 15k like tiny tiny things like trying to get that and you also had to get like load of text and fonts in there and logos in there and branded stuff and then whatever kind of 
6k or whatever you had left over is what you kind of have to kind of program it Right. Um, so do a kind of a range of different things like little little platformers, um, little puzzles, just simple interactive quizzes. Um, I did a, a program to a Rubik's cube and various various sort of things like little sort of mini things that you could try and try yeah. and um, make interact. So more like interactive, like not even really games in some you know in some in some ways. Yeah. Um, then. Over the last sort of 12 years, I've been working um, for myself, and my, so my, myself and my wife run our, our own digital uh, design agency, um, doing marketing and advertising. But we also do apps and games and animations and kind of fun creative stuff. It's always the kind of the design and creative side of things is is, is primarily the angle we come from. Okay. Um, and we've ended up, I think one, one client came to us and asked us to do a little game and then once you've done one other people kind of come and go oh I, you know we needed a game as well and this person recommended you and through word of mouth we ended up doing loads of little little games right um usually God, just a mix of like puzzle things um children's games as well so although they might be slightly point and clicky in that there's a scene and you have to click on the right object they weren't like a like a classic point and click yeah. adventure um they were very much sort of focused on one particular task you had to do okay. um then we got a we got a brief from one of our clients which is the uh roman baths museum in bath in the uk and they kind of approached us and said we've we've made a little little mini film um, about a character who loses his cloak in the Roman baths, and he's, you know, he's Roman. You know, it's not yeah. just not just like some guy. <laughs> um, so he's like kind of a Roman merchant, and he loses his cloak, and he wants to find out who nicked it, and I think he wants to curse them as well. That's what Romans right. did. They, they, okay, they, yeah. they, they're into that sort of thing, um, and they kind of wanted something interactive or a game or something that would accompany that. Yeah. So we took that narrative and kind of pitched to them the idea of a classic point and click adventure game so sort of pixel arty and um very narrative driven so you are this character and you have to go and interact with other people talk to them trade items objects go and fetch quests and sort of create a sort of little little mini game yeah. uh, and and they bought it they said yeah go on we'll 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 do that um amazingly so we then kind of had uh, i think it was about three months to produce that Wow, okay. um, having at this stage having no uh, no experience with game engines at all, I didn't. I I'd never heard of game engines. I didn't know what a game engine was. Yeah. I didn't know that indie game developers existed. I didn't know there was a whole in, you know indie game industry out there. Yeah. Um. So I kind of programmed it all from scratch in JavaScript as a kind of web based thing. That that was that was kind of the, where I come from. That was the language I knew. Um, so I kind of programmed it and sort of produced it, and as as you do in kind of marketing, you you get given a brief, you produce it, you get paid, you move on. So yeah, fine. Yeah, Part of that. Uh, then a couple of years ago, uh, COVID happened, lovely, and we were st stuck at home for a lot longer with uh, a, a certain amount of our work kind of dried up because uh, a lot of our clients like the Roman Baths were tourist attractions or museums they all had yeah, to close their doors so that, uh, you know kind of a lot of that went so we ended up with um you know a few a few weeks a couple of months where during the first sort of lockdown where we had a lot of lot of, lot of time on our hands so yeah. I kind of I'd always once I'd created the the Roman Baths game I always wanted to reuse that that engine that i created to, to yeah. make another game so i created another game called lockdown which was all about the life we were experiencing in lockdown at the time in the uk yeah. running out of toilet paper uh, having to do <laughs> home, homeschooling and um you know and everyone kind of having to you know satisfy whatever social media pressure is out there and and kind of yeah. various different things um so kind of created that again quite a small game probably no more than an hour to play it um and i kind of put, put that out there on on twitter once i produced it 
and it got picked up just coincidentally. I happened to kind of produce it and release it, I suppose, at the same time as an adventure jam was finishing. Um, so it kind of it got picked up by a, a couple of Twitch streamers <coughs> who included it in their sort of roundup of adventure games and went, well, it wasn't it wasn't part of the game jam, but you released it at this time, and you know they they were British as well, and they kind of went, yeah, go on, we'll stick that in there. Um, yeah. But at that stage, that that was then suddenly I'm I'm part of these conversations on Twitter with people and a whole community of people I've never knew existed, all these kind of yeah. independent. Um, adventure game developers who knew there are there are people who actually make games like this i had no idea i i assumed no one else would bother making point and click adventure games anymore why yeah why why would that you know nobody nobody seems to buy them so why would you make them and you know i never i certainly never saw any in the shops kind of you know after you know the mid 90s and just kind of you know, you know i think the last one last actually i think the last ones i bought was like um monkey island for, oh no, I did buy. I bought some of the Telltale games. Yes. Ones, yeah. but again, they were they were very different. They were like three D ones rather than um, like pixel art type things. So, yeah. but there's all of a sudden there's like you know I kind of look at all the jam games that are there. I go, wow, there's like there's loads of other people like me making games like this. Um, so I kind of started. People started saying, well, what game engine did you use? I'm like, I don't know. What, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> You know, I've, I've literally, I've never heard of, of Twitch before. I've never heard of indie game developers. It's like, it's, it's like a real kind of just head, head first straight into this whole world that I had no idea even existed until sort of a few days earlier. Um, and yeah, again, like we said, like you said, the adventure game community. So whether it's devs or fans or whoever it is, are, they're, they're just so supportive and so kind of, creative and so happy to to kind of lend their advice and their support it was it was really easy to then start saying well if i was going to do a proper game what, how would i do that you know and people you know so what what game engine do you use then it's like is that the right question to ask when people say oh i use um, adventure game creator or i use unity or i use whatever yeah. um so i kind of did a bit of research started using um adventure game studio and uh it was it was okay it kind of i was beginning to i sort of put, cobbled something together and went okay um and then thought well i'll try i'll try another engine um, and downloaded one called uh, visionaire studio which is okay, made, yeah. made by um it's people in germany and it was you can download a free trial for it so i kind of did that and that ha that was much slicker so you have to it, it, it uh, adventure game studio is free right visionaire you can have the free trial but if you want to actually publish games you do have to pay for it so it is more expensive and when you publish bigger games it gets more expensive depending on what platforms okay. you want to kind of you, know, you want to do it on yeah um, and, and kind of how much money you know the bigger the bigger the project the more amount of you know the kind of you've got a certain amount of crowdfunding uh, support in there then that kind of you have to you, you have to have a sort of like bigger license and and things like that um but it was a much slicker piece of software and it's the way that it was structured just slotted really well into what i'd already produced so although my html creation was an abomination in many ways it was it was structured vaguely in a, in a in a way you know it had scenes characters objects items um dialogue things like that and had these kind of different elements to it that when i opened up visionaire all the settings and all the properties for all of these different things were there and they were where i expected to find them so i found it very very easy to very quickly put together a a mock-up i think i downloaded like a little sprite of guy brush and then right. had, and had like, kind of like you know had him, i went you know within like an hour i'd got him walking around in the scene in a way system picking up a pink box and putting it in his inventory and then putting it down again and, and it's like right i can i can i've got the basics now i can yeah. do what i you know, do what i need to do um so then just yeah that was kind of how i got into in into sort of adventure game development i suppose and then it was just kind of 
coming up with an idea and something that was going to make a make make a game out of. Yeah, and actually, that's um, I don't know if you know Barry Aldridge from Twitter. He yeah, posts yeah. quite a lot on your things. He he was going to ask what I what are the main inspirations for for Lucy Dreaming? What what was sort of the main things you drew on? So there there are a few things. It's quite a few kind of tactical, I suppose, um, decisions. I I didn't. One of the things that people really liked about the lockdown game was that it was based in a familiar reality. It was okay. ba it's based, loosely based in, I mean, you know, this is for British people. Like, I mean, there are a lot of people around the world who look at it and go, that's, that's not my life there. But it's, it, it was, it kind of reflected what I knew. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was kind of middle class Britain, first world problem solving. Yeah. Um, and that was it kind of it resonated really well with with people that was really like and it's something that i i think fitted quite nicely with the kind of dialogue and the kind of jokes and the kind of writing that i like to to do yeah. um so i quite like i liked the idea originally of, of, of it being something that is set in the real world it's not some fantastical sci-fi or yeah, fairy tale land or fa fantasy thing so there's that i didn't want it to be a specific genre so not a genre theme so yeah. like like i said like sci-fi or pirates or something like that. i didn't i didn't want it to, to focus around any one particular type of thing mainly because i didn't want to be kind of accused of being too derivative i didn't want people to look at it right. and go well, it's just a poor man's Monkey Island, or it's a it's a yeah, it's a yeah. it's a poor man's King's Quest or Space Quest or whatever. You know, I want it yeah. to be something. I suppose the most the thing it's most similar to is probably something like Maniac Mansion, where it's kind of it's slightly mad, it's slightly crazy, but it's still in theory it's kind of it's the real world. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Not so much Dare the Tentacle, maybe. <laughs> uh, but that's I suppose that's that and that's, and that's something. And also I suppose. Um, Thimbleweed Park as well, to a degree. Yes. So yeah. it's it's kind of, I suppose it's more, and I think I, uh, that's that's sort of two of the main comparisons that people kind of draw when they play it. And that's what I was aiming for, not in terms of replicating the style necessarily, but in terms of the, the actual setting of it. Yeah. Um, in terms of the narrative, um, as I, I think you'll appreciate, um, we have a young child um and yeah. that is very much dominating every corner and crevice of our lives to, yes. you know, to a, a, a ridiculous degree um so one of the things that we've always done and um, from when he was you know tiny is always kind of read to it like yeah we, the amount of children's storybooks around the house is just insane like, yeah, i know it's, you mean it's yeah. ridiculous. um so um one of one of the things that he's he's always had, which I I I don't particularly have. My wife does a bit, but he has very. He always had very kind of relevant dreams. So you know, like in a film, someone or or a cartoon, somebody will see something or they'll be doing something, and then they'll dream about it really vividly, like about yeah. you know they're making a sandwich, and then all of a sudden they go to they go to bed, and there's like giant pieces of bread following them and things yeah, like that yeah, he, he'd have dreams like that like he'd, okay. he'd say oh i was dreaming this and then this happened and this happened he's like this is literally you've just like taken these elements of these books and just kind of happen um so i really wanted something that um i don't want to kind of reveal too much about the game but there's there's a real mechanic of um of kind of books being involved and okay. then being able to control your dreams yeah. with by being inspired by things so it's not although it's kind of it's a play on words with lucid and lucy dreaming yeah. it's not kind of it's not kind of learning psychological te local uh, psychological techniques for lucid dreaming and that kind of thing. it's much okay. more kind of being inspired by and kind of if you do this and you and you kind of you, you act on this then you it then in, it kind of influences what happens while you're asleep and then yeah. i i really like that idea of having these kind of two worlds that you could inhabit you can you can you can be in this kind of really mundane um 
boring kind of town that's just you know every, everyone's just you know it's, it's going nowhere and everyone's just kind of really miserable and and and, things. and then you can go to sleep and it's just insane and there's just kind yeah. of mad shit going on and having ways of solving puzzles in both although you can't take items from one place to another because that's just i suppose in theory i suppose you could take it you could have an item in the real world and then you dream about it and i suppose you could you could sort of maybe have a mechanic that does that might make a note of that <laughs> um, but in terms of in, in terms of the kind of the actual you know your physical presence in is, is going to be different but you can learn stuff or remember stuff or um un, you know other sort of hidden memories or something like that in, in your dreams and then that information you can use to unlock information right, puzzles okay. in the real world and equally you can influence what's going on in your dreams and kind of go oh, I've, I've learned something in the real world if i then go into the dream world i now know this and i can kind of right. use that there. but it allowed me to create <clears throat> multiple little mini adventures and mini genres so i could have pirates in there if i wanted to i could have you know aliens i could have underwater stuff i could have you know it could, it could, i could put whatever i want in there yeah um but it's it's all it's it's not that's not all the game is it's not all kind of so you know um focused on one particular thing okay yeah there you go yeah. that's the short answer <laughs> makes sense <laughs> um so i mean you mentioned monkey island in there so i can't ever have a conversation with anyone about adventure games about mentioning monkey island because this my favorite I hate series. Monkey Island. Never yeah. enjoyed it. <laughs> so, best Monkey Island game in your opinion? Two. two. And, right. No. It. Well. Yes. T uh, two. But I'm also very aware why it's two and not one. Okay. And it's mainly. It would probably be the. It probably be Secret of Monkey Island, if I hadn't. <sighs> kind of discovered that at a friend's house when he'd already solved an awful lot of the puzzles and was kind of doing me a walkthrough and I'm going, oh, what's this kind of thing? I've never played this sort of game before. And he's going, oh, well, you do this and you do this and you do this and you do this and then you go to this person and then you ask them this and then they learn this and, and you know, and you go, oh, right, oh, that's cool. Yeah. You know, and I think then I bought a copy of it for myself um, maybe a couple of years later and was able to just kind of go, oh, I already know all this. Um, and then when I got to sort of the second act of the game. So, like, oh, this is new. This is cool. So I really like the second and third acts. And I've, although I really appreciate it, I love the first act as well, because it was kind of, I saw it as spoilers before I played it as a game. I'm, it's right. kind of gone, I never got the chance to figure those out for myself. Yeah. The second one came out um, and I discovered it for myself. So I mean I love the the music in it. It's just it's just it's yeah. just astonishing. I love I love the um I love the artwork. Um I love the humor of it, of the first two kind of equally. But I because I discovered it for myself and played through and completed it all, and I feel like I earned I earned my wings on that one. Um, yeah, whereas I never really did on the first one. So, um, I've I've enjoyed I enjoyed Curse of Monkey Island. Yeah. I again I didn't I think it was probably because our hardware wasn't good enough. But I didn't play that until many, many years later. I kinda of came back and, and I thought maybe I picked up a copy probably a bootleg copy, I don't know. Um or picked it up in like a second hand shop or something. Yeah. And uh, and kind of played it and went, Oh, yeah, that's, that's good. But it was it was strange for me because that's not what Guybrush sounded like. Yeah, as a, yeah, you know, and you'll know this as a as a Brit kind of playing. Although you know it's not, you know, it's not set in the UK. When he, you know, the the humor's quite dry and the humor's quite sarky, and it doesn't, yes. it doesn't, you don't hear it in an American accent. No, you don't. No, that's right. <laughs> so suddenly you've got Guybrush coming in. You're like, and it's and he's it's it's um, Dominic Amato's doing. You know, he does an amazing job with the voice. Yeah. But it's and some people say that's it's perfect. It's my Guybrush, and that's that's who it is. But for me, it was like, ooh. He's, he sounds a bit. He sounds a bit young. Or he sounds yeah, a bit, you know. Yeah. And, and and he also his appearance changed. He suddenly yes. he was he was he was in the second one. He was like this kind of slightly rough looking guy with like he slightly was, yeah. unshaven with a kind of ponytail. And then all of a sudden he's like this kind of tall, lanky, blonde guy kind of walking around. Like, oh, it's like he, he... so. It was a good game, um, but it was it's it's very very different, very different. Yeah, and yeah. that 
the second one is is kind of I suppose that's where my heart still still lies. We won't talk okay. about we won't talk about the fourth one. So you don't like the fourth one? See, that's you know what I don't mind it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't mind it. That's the thing. I suppose I have I have nothing particularly specifically bad to say about it. But that it, it's kind of a bit. Yeah, it has a couple of issues, especially the controls. The controls are absolutely awful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, I quite like the fourth one, but yeah. it, it definitely has problems that the the previous games didn't have. And they changed Guybrush's character a little bit. He came across as a bit of a bit of a jerk. Yeah, he wasn't. Yeah, he wasn't. Yeah, he, wasn't he wasn't. He wasn't the kind of lo a lovable sort of like dimwit. He was actually. No. He actually yeah, he was. He was a bit kind of not just not as likable, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, I think it's just that I I don't I don't get. Like when I remember different puzzles and different scenes about the first two, it actually gets me really kind of excited. Oh yeah, I really must play that again. And then I and then I kind of remember the fourth one. I go, I can't really remember the fourth one. I think yeah. I remember I remember Star Buccaneers. Yeah. And I remember <laughs> some kind of really weird hideous thing that you make, like with like a weird head and stuff, like kind of combining lots of yeah. weird like, like prosthetics or something. The abomination of nature. Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. kind of remember that. But I don't really remember what you do with it or what happened. I don't really remember much about, about Yeah. I quite enjoy the Telltale games. I quite enjoy Tales of Monkey Island, to be honest. Yeah, I know they, they've got um, a lot of people kind of don't... I mean, you know, everybody's everybody's got their favourites and they've got their reasons why. Yeah. I, I, I played through them all. I, they were they were solid games. I enjoyed them. Yeah, they were all right. Yeah, I think so as well, yeah. Um, Monkey Combat, yes or no? I don't even remember which one was that. Was that the fourth was one. Was that the fourth, the fourth one? one? Where Did you I... have to do the, the combinations of what move beats what and all that stuff. Is that is that the one? I don't wanna, I don't want to spoil anything. Is that the one where it's it's highly unintuitive? It's the one where the solutions change every single game, and you've got to make a big list of the combinations to change to each move. And you know what? Maybe I didn't. Maybe I never completed it. I don't even <laughs> remember that. Maybe I just blanked it out. It probably um, a lot. A lot of people shudder at the sound of, of yeah, that. Yeah, I don't little mini game. No, I don't. I'm not sure. Of <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think I've heard people talking about it, and I think I've assumed it was something else, and I, maybe I've just completely forgotten. Look it up. I will. <laughs> and, then I'll, and, then, and then I'll. And then I'll. I'll wish I hadn't. And I'll, yeah. I'll go. Like, oh, oh, it was that. Yeah. More than likely. All right, let's talk a little bit about the um the Kickstarter campaign then for, mm -hmm. for Lucy Dreaming because that was. I mean, it was massively successful, wasn't it? It went really well, and I've, I've yeah. seen other people saying that it's like an absolute roller coaster. So, was that what it was like for you? Just like an absolutely crazy period of time? It's yeah, it's it's mad. It's 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 not wasn't necessarily a roller coaster. I think it's probably a, ro a more of a roller coaster if you've um, got to the point where you're kind of in the last leg of it and you've not quite meet your goal met your goal yet and then so there's a real roller coaster of emotion as you go and they're like can we make it can we make it can we go, 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 go. and like um we were kind of fortunate enough that we funded within within the first few days yeah so that kind of that was that was fine everything after that was was kind of was was bonus which was good um so it wasn't a roller coaster emotionally it was just really 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 hard work yeah um there was probably a good five or six months before the campaign where i was putting again an equal amount of work in just trying to build up the community and the the word of mouth and just sort of a bit of a buzz about it kind of releasing um screenshots and trailers and um the demo and all sorts of bits and pieces to try and get people to you know, to, to sort of um, follow the, the Kickstarter before it launched. So that when it launches, we've got enough people there to kind of give it a bit of a, a boost at the start. Um, so, yeah, really, really kind of hard work. Um, I was, I was saying before, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a bit, I, I went back into my fold. I've got a folder on my machine, which has got all the different graphics that I created throughout the campaign. Yeah. And there are over 300 individual graphics that I've used to promote it on various different channels, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, things like that. Some of them are video, some of them are animated 
git files some of them are jp some are, but they've all been designed they've all been created and they're all for specific purposes so some of them focus on the fact that it's like if you love monkey island you'll love this and some of them are like you know if you loved um maniac mansion you like it, you know um or if you like you know some of them are like it's really retro it's really you know his pixel art it's it's funny it's british it's whatever the different any different angle i had i would kind of do it and then fire it off and you try to use as many kind of relevant hashtags as i could and try and get the right message in front of the right people reddit was really hard to crack that one i i i still to this day i don't quite Reddit, Reddit's not my natural habitat, so I, 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 I managed to get a couple of good um, posts on there that, that received well. Usually it was um, like time-lapse videos of artwork and things like that. They, they kind of went down quite well. Um, but other, uh, you know, others just trying to kind of promote stuff in a sort of, I, you know, I, I've worked in advertising. As soon as they get a whiff of anyone kind of trying to advertise to them, it's just like... You, you can piss off. You know, yeah, like, yeah. um, so that was that was quite hard. But then, so because there's, I mean, there's, bear in mind the whole, you know, the camp. This is this is this is just stuff created while the campaign was running. So the campaign ran for like thirty days. So that was an average of like over ten graphics a day. I was producing and putting out there like throughout the whole. It was like absolutely non-stop just hard hard work and i'm you know i'm again i'm lucky enough that i'm able to produce those graphics so i'm a graphic designer i can i can quite happily boot up photoshop throw it throw a thing together and, and, and kind of get it out there relatively quickly if you don't have those kind of skills at your fingertips it's quite it's very difficult to kind of react to something very quickly you know, some, someone could say something and make a little joke on Twitter and you see there's a bit of traction and people start doing it. You go, right, I can make a graphic of Lucy saying something or make it or kind of, go, oh, that reminds me of this. And kind of put your game again out, you know, yeah. I think. So it was, yeah, just really, really hard work. <laughs> but, it, but it paid off. That's it, it, absolutely, yeah. That, that actually ties into um, Ruben from Aruma Studios. All right, yeah. He, he did say, because you've got a background in marketing, my background is actually in marketing as well. He said, is there anything... I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> he said, is there anything you can sort of give tips-wise for marketing a game that you would say is slightly different to normal marketing? Because from my... Obviously, I've never marketed a game, but from my standpoint, it looks a little bit different to it seems to, it seems to be very different because i think the marketplace is very different so normally if you're looking at kind of consumer products or services like b2b services or something like that you, you very much you need it's like anything like if you if you're working selling stuff within the construction industry you need to know exactly who those decision makers are and what they're buying and things like that so i think with i think with adventure games and kind of especially kind of point to click adventure games it's probably a bit different to the games industry generally anyway i think if you are if you're a triple a studio producing games your whatever i you know whatever approach works for me is not going to work for you it's a very different audience you've got very different um i don't at the moment i can't offer an awful lot of advice because i've not actually marketed a game yet yeah what i've done is i've promoted a campaign yeah which is much more familiar to me okay. so there's a there's a thing there's a kickstarter thing happening so i've done i've done marketing before where it's there's a competition or there's an event or there's a campaign running which is a particular message this is these are the, these are the kind of key selling points and this is your target audience and you go out there and you tell people about it and you give them a reason to to kind of engage with it and promoting a kickstarter campaign is much more familiar territory for me promoting a game in terms of when it's actually released it's still a, a, a complete unknown for me so there's a there's a lot of um conversation going with ruben i've seen is really kind of really involved with this as well with trying to work out the um the importance of uh, like wish lists and the algorithm that steam use and kind of what that means i'm at the moment i'm just going to focus on having fun making a game yeah. Because if I lose focus on that, I might as well just go back to my day job. I might as well just be doing my, I might as well just be doing what I was regularly doing. No, I'm doing this because it's really good fun. Like it's really good fun. Um, 
and I will I will quite happily if I'm doing dev I will quite happily kind of in, in an evening and like we'll put up our little boy to bed and I'll say right, I'm just I'm just going to do I'm just going to do a couple of, a couple of little things I just wanted to tie up and and, and they'll be like yeah so I'll, I, I won't see you for the rest of the night it's like no 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 it's fine I'll be back in I'll be back in you know, it'll be like half an hour or something like <laughs> and then I'll kind of go just just this and I'll look and it'll be two in the morning by the next time I kind of look at my clock it's just insane I I just I get so into it and I just love it it's just so much fun. Um, so I want to I want to kind of focus on that and I want to enjoy the process. I'm not getting too bogged down in what how many units I'm going to sell later on. Yeah. Um, I'm also I'm kind of this is this is this is almost definitely my own naivety, um, but I'm not I don't really see the the importance of having to get because I because I don't have a publisher and my overheads are relatively small. I mean I I'm, I have a luxurious position that I don't and I've paid I, the Kickstarter's paid for it. It's already paid for. When we release, I, I'm not going to have lost any money. I, there may still be a bit left in the bank depending on what we pay. But it's you know what I mean. As far as I'm concerned, it's paid for itself. I'm doing it as a vanity project. It's a bit of fun and it yeah, doesn't it, it doesn't need to be. It's not it's. Ruben's very different in that he is um, a full-time game dev, so he he needs it to work and he needs it to sell a certain amount of units in order to be worthwhile doing it in the first place. Um, but I'm there. A lot of people are very kind of focused on the launch and making sure that when the game launches on Steam um, or whatever platform you've got it on, that it gets immediately gets you know hits a certain amount. I don't know if that's if there's a knock-on effect, like if you do that, then you get you appear in like best kind of up-and-coming games, or but you know, yeah. or, or something like that, and then there's like a, a knock-on effect, or whether that's that's the kind of the trajectory and that's the focus of it. Um, my thought is, I want to be able to release it with a with a good chance of, of people buying it. Don't get me wrong, I'm, you know, I'd like people to buy, it. Um, but then my feeling is that it's going to be out there, and I can market it after it's once it's released. I can kind of market it and advertise it kind of at my leisure then I could kind of keep, you know, and if more people find it later on, that just gives it a much longer tail of, of, of sales rather than a huge peak right at the beginning. But overall, by the time you get to sort of five years down the line, I would hope that it, if you, you know, it would be the same amount of people roughly who've, who've kind of played it, you know, even, yeah. if, they, even yeah. if they discovered it later on. Um, so, what, what do I, I do? I have any kind of? I don't have any marketing wisdom. I, I'm. I, am I? Am I worried? Am I, I'm not. I'm not worried because, like I said, I'm quite. I'm quite comfortable with the, the the position I am with it. Is that even even if it only sold ten units once it's gone live, because we've had the Kickstarter, it's yeah. it's at least I'm not. I'm not in kind of dire straits. It's covering my time to be able to do it. Um. But I do, there's a lot of, it's a bit like search marketing. Yeah. There's a lot of, ooh, the algorithm. What does the algorithm do? Yeah, what do yeah. If I do this, does it, if I can, can I, can I play it? Can I do that? Uh, and my, my thought with whenever, you know, whenever I've sort of heard people trying to trick Google, trying to, you know, with, with, with the kind of search marketing is always make, make the content, concentrate on the content, make sure the content is good, make sure the content's engaging and then get it in, you know, try and just get, talk to people, get, get it in front of people. And I know that's obviously the key of such marketing is getting in front of more people. Um, but that's that's my sort of key thing is I don't want to be so wrapped up in the the, the kind of the marketing and the algorithm of it that I kind of lose sight of actually just having fun. Yeah, that's it. That's the main thing, isn't it? <laughs> and I think, yeah, I think if you have fun making a game, I think it comes across. I think, you, yeah, could, you know what I mean? Yeah, you could, yeah, there's a certain amount of energy or a certain amount of kind of humour. I think you, you can't... Especially, I think if you're writing a game which is very much focused on kind of a light-hearted, humorous approach, yeah. if you if you lose sight of that and you start getting a bit kind of miserable when you're doing it or stressed, then it, you can't you can't write light-hearted, no. humorous stuff. It's just kind of just a, that way there are times in the game which slightly darker. Maybe that's what I've been more stressed and like, like it's like they're like i feel like i develop a particular character when i'm particularly stressed and like they come out just like all oh, my angst just comes out of the dialogue that i like <laughs> yeah maybe it does i'll go back and like, oh right yeah that was me just before christmas so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i mean do you think things like well obviously the steam next fest and there was the big adventure event 
a couple of, well, it's about a month ago now, I think. Yeah. It? The things like that help get eyes on the game, like a, a different market than you would just by sort of tweeting things out and using social media, do you think? Yeah, in terms of like wish lists and things. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't know what Next Best is going to, is going to bring. Um, the big adventure event was the first Steam event that I've ever taken part in. So it was a huge learning curve, learning how to organize broadcasts and events and being part of something that I, 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 it was quite alien to me, you know, the whole sort of setup of it. I, it's not something I know anything about, I've never done it before. Okay. Um, but looking at the data afterwards, I've got kind of wish list levels for the, my fingers, to, I'll do it here, so it's, it's in front of me. So I've got kind of wish list levels like this over the year. And then I've got like a little sort of, that's where, you know, the Kickstarter, like, oh, you know, you can see where the wish list went up. And before, yeah. when you used to look at the graph, that was like, woo, like that. And now it is absolutely dwarfed in comparison to this kind of spike that happened during the, the adventure event. Um, obviously, that was um, the core audience. That was adventure game fans going yeah. up to Steam looking for the latest, you know, adventure games that are going to be out. Um, but we, we didn't get a huge amount of activity on you know on twitter or anything particularly yeah. um, it wasn't picked up by loads of different streamers or anything like that a few people got a bit more than that i think yeah. some of it um was also down to when so we had broadcasts going uh, everyone had kind of a scheduled spot yeah they'd have a broadcast and some people um who were right, sort of right at the beginning or right at the end of the campaign uh, sorry of the, of the event um, got, got a decent amount of, of views, but then on the Saturday, Steam featured the event on their homepage. So anyone who happened to be broadcasting in that sort of, you know, however, however many hours it was, period, yeah, it like went from like four or five hundred views in your video to ten thousand views in your video. So it's like it was yeah. like ridiculous sort of, you know, exponential kind of amount of, of um, views on that. So I think some people and some games like had a massive benefit um from that and that's been um, but i'm we lucy dreamy didn't particularly because we broadcast earlier on um i think there were also maybe some issues with our cover artwork which i've now tweaked um again le learning the whole time going, you know what maybe it didn't look appealing but now when you can sort of see it in context of all the other games you go maybe it doesn't stand out as much or it needs a bit more of this or it's not you can't read the text very clearly or something yeah. so i've tweaked that for next best who knows whether that make any difference um but just kind of constantly sort of tweaking and, and trying to sort of hone it as i go along um but i don't yeah it's be it, it's it's a it's a it's a really kind of good experience um it was quite again that was quite it was quite stressful because i didn't really know what was yeah. going on half the time and i'm trying to kind of <laughs> kind of cobble stuff together and learn how to do a, a, a broadcast on steam and yeah or, i don't know i can do it now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just wing it until you figure it out. Yeah, it's that's, that's that is the whole, that is my life for the last few years. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about big boxes then, because you, you put up some some pictures of big boxes. I mean, shall I go and get one? Okay. Yeah. Do you yeah, want to show you? Right, yeah, hang on, hang on. I'll disappear for a second. I'll just reach, reach into the purple clouds behind me and suddenly <laughs> there's like a magic door that opens. Yeah. So I've got, I have a few, I have a few big boxes myself. Um, so I've got it's like a, I've got a couple of uh, broken swords, a couple of um, like Simon the Sorcerer and yep. um, some Monkey Island and things as well. Um, but so this is this is the oh stand up I might have to stand up. Yeah. So this is the the box. Yeah, I'm gonna stand up. There we go. Just about to see it. Just about to see it. Yeah. Yeah. There, um, oh, 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 oh. there we go. Yeah. There we go. So you can you can see it. This is this is one of the um, Kickstarter rewards. And the, the other thing I was trying to point out is compare it to the classic Broken Sword yeah. and Monkey Island boxes. You have a you have an exact match for, for dimensions and levels. Um, so if you if you are a collector of big box games, then they'll, they'll, they'll look very nice on your shelf. That's it. It won't be like a weird one that sticks out a little bit too high, or just or just slightly too deep, or just a bit annoying. It's like a classic adventure game thing, isn't it, to have, to have the big box? I know people are, like, desperate to get their hands on them now. 
Yeah, so no, that's good. We've got a couple of a couple of samples of, um, of these through, and they, the the, the quality is really nice. So really, really happy with those. Um, and there's a load of stuff um, for Kickstarter packing as well. There's a load of stuff going in them as well. There's some cool, cool bits and pieces. I'm not sure if we've got any of those things. Not yet. Is that, is that something that people will be able to to get after launch? If say say people go, oh, you know, I really want a big box. Is that something they'll be able to, to pay for? What I'm probably going to do is produce a slightly different one okay um i don't i don't want to devalue the um kickstarter rewards yeah. um that people have back because people back me early and they back me without knowing you know whether i can deliver or what I, you know what's going yeah, on yeah. um and i want to i want to pay that back so okay. i'm there are, i may do one which has um slightly different stuff in it yeah. Um, so one of the things that's going to be in the Kickstarter box is the the game is going to be on a like a USB cassette. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so that's sort of part because there's, there's a cassette puzzle in the demo and as well. And there's there's kind of cassettes are in the full game as well. There's a bit of kind of theme there. Um, so I kind of I like that idea. And uh, there's going to be there's other there's like beer mats and some stickers and um, there's like a, a comic and art book that I've written as well. So what I'm probably going to do is pair that down and yeah. maybe offer those either as individual things for sale maybe if I want it like just kind of merch generally um, yeah. or produce different ones that aren't, aren't so maybe the art book and comic thing will be uh, rather than being kind of I remember it's about 32 pages at the moment so rather than doing that maybe doing like a 16 page one and having it more yeah. like a kind of a, a sort of a manual that goes in there um, so they so there's still be a make like a big box version available if people want to yeah, okay. But it's not quite as exclusive. It's not got the same stuff in it that the, the Kickstarter rewards would. Yeah. So if people have missed the big box now, will they be able to get the there, Kickstarter one? Because some people might only find out about the game now and think, oh, I'm quite I have. To to that. So I, I have. If anyone contacts me directly, yeah. um, either people who backed the game at a lower level and yeah. want to kind of sort of upgrade to a to a big box i'm allowing i'm sort of happy to, to organize that via paypal and kind of do that okay. also equally if somebody kind of comes to me and says look i've only just discovered it i'd really like a big box i am i am happy to discuss that on a kind of single base i'm not going to start start in, like setting it up on back of kit or setting up a yeah. shop which allows people to kind of keep backing i know that would make sense from a financial point of view but i just Good idea. i just it it's it for me the the Kickstarter has a certain level of integrity to it, and I want yeah. to maintain that. So I'm quite until until the game is finished. Yeah. Um, once I get to that point, I'm not going to be accepting any more. But until that point, like I haven't ordered these things yet. So if somebody wants to kind of go, oh, you know, I really is there any way to do it? I'm quite happy to add them to the same spreadsheet that I've got in in Kickstarter. There have been a couple of people who've done that. Okay. Um, but, but until I get to, until when I've actually kind of started ordering these sort of physical things, and then, then once I've done that, but then it's that's going to be the kind of cutoff point. Um, so maybe you've got like two or three months left before yeah. I okay. so, so if anyone before I draw a line under it, they should get in touch with you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, uh, there's uh, I think on uh, there's down down there you can see there's uh, uh, the Tool Story Games um, handle is the same on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, so anything at Tool Story Games, you can you can you can get in touch. All do all do yours now. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you got time for one more? Or yeah, go for it. Um, about you as a person, then, is there anything that you've discovered about yourself in the process of making Lucy Dreaming that, that has surprised you? Mm. Yeah, I I'm re I, I'm. <laughs> quite disorganized very disorganized i had so there's something um so f called feature creep or scope creep yep. which a lot of developers will have which is where you kind of as you're building something you go oh it would be really wouldn't it be good if it did this or would it be cool if it did this or if i tweak it i could just make it a bit better yeah. and because Especially until until I, once I had sort of had the, the kind of the Kickstarter sort of there, 
um, and to kind of have the backers who I then had to deliver against and with us within a kind of reasonable time frame. Before that point, it was even worse. Um, but basically, because I had no one else to answer to, I'd be there going, oh, brilliant, I, I, I can, you know, I'll make a, I, I'll, I'll, a, a puzzle would just spiral out of control. Yeah. So I had one, which was a, a in, my, in my kind of narrative plan, my, my puzzle bit, I had a little block. And it said, um, Lucy gets book from the library. I don't think that's a spoiler. I think that's, that's a fair thing. Because it is now, you don't, like, I was like, yeah, brilliant. You know, so I could just, I could, I could, I could do that. I could put a line, I can put a book on the shelf. She can go in, she can give it to the librarian. She can stamp it if she wants. Job done. Only now, that puzzle, just, just to get the book out of the library, in, now has an extra four scenes and an extra three characters and a whole load of puzzles going on there that kind of work across the whole, the whole of the town that she lives in just to get the book out of the library. That was, I'm quite happy with that. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still, you know, it, I think it's, I think it's funny. Most of it came out of um, one, sorry, I'm just checking that. Sorry, I was just checking the audio on the recording there, and it's because you're not speaking. I said, okay. oh, sorry, oh, God, there's no audio. No, there is. Okay. You know, I can cut that out. That's fine. I won't cut it out. I'll leave it in there. Outtakes. Brilliant. Um, so, um, I'm quite happy that that puzzle's in there, and but it, most of it sort of came from, like, one line I wrote. I think I, I wrote... There's one bit of dialogue I wrote... And it was like, it was like, it was just like a little aside. Like she speaks to the librarian and she says something like, um, like something about automatic book stamping machines or something like that. Yeah. And the, the librarian just says, oh, they're the work of Satan. <laughs> and then like the whole, there's the whole thing is now there's a, there's a whole like under story and the, uh, like backstory of the whole library being run by Satan. It's like the whole thing's just like, <laughs> Just kind of got slightly out of control, um, so I do have to be careful with that. I learnt my lesson with that. That's quite early on in the game, yeah. And I've now tightened things up a lot, so I'm now getting all of the other sort of bits and pieces done. Because I mean, the whole puzzle of getting the live book out of there probably takes an hour or so to complete. Okay. It's like it's, it's like a it's like a it's a big old <laughs> multifaceted puzzle now. Um, so it's as far as I can say, it was fun and it's added stuff to the game. It's not; it doesn't feel like it's filler. It doesn't, you know, it feels like it's just part, you know, yeah. just a bit of fun. Um, so, yeah. So I'm. That's something I've definitely learned is I need to be more disciplined and I need to not just let it run away with me. But also, there's I've I, I you know I've, I have I've had a, a, a blog that I kind of I've kept I haven't sort of had it on for a while, but where I talk about my kind of the process that I've been going through and it is a very organic process because it's it's something I've not done before yeah. so I'm learning as I go and I am much I, I am quite loose with the way I would plan kind of puzzles I go well like in some bits in my narrative in my kind of puzzle thing it just says um, she discovers this through an elaborate puzzle probably involving this and it's like, and that'll be that'll be it. And I kind of wait till I get to that point and go, oh, brilliant! I wonder what that puzzle is. And then I'll kind of do it. And it and it'll also depend on what other things have I've created in the meantime. I'll go, hang on a minute, I can bring this character in. I can do this. I can, and, and kind of it evolves as it goes along. Um, yeah. And it also allows me to be quite sort of flexible in terms of sort of going back and sort of creating little mini stories of other characters that are kind of doing things as they go along and they go well, hang on because that person went off and did that they could come back at this point and they're, 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 they're now they've been they've been vomiting for four hours so now they're going to look like this <laughs> and they're going to you know they're also you know whatever it is i can yeah. kind, of, kind of move things out. so it's if i do if i if i do another commercial game after this i will be a lot more organized Okay. And, I will, and I will, I will, I will limit the amount of feature creep um, to a minimum. But I have really enjoyed it. What I'm hoping is, it doesn't. I'm hoping it doesn't come across as just a bit of a, just a madness. I want yeah. it, you know. I, I want it to. I want it, it's got. It, it, there is a there is a narrative flow through it, and I'm trying to keep that kind of 
strong all the time, every time, you know, kind of reinforcing, going, take you back to recovery. So you've got a clear idea of where you're going at any one point and why. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, there's just lots of mad crap happening around you that may seem irrelevant at the time and probably yeah. is. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, that's good. So it's, it's sort of like puzzle logic quite difficult because I, I always see the way people approach puzzles can be very, very different from one person to the next that like i'll, I'll play a game and people go oh, this has got moon logic and i'll just think that, that just makes sense and yeah vice versa so is it quite difficult to craft a puzzle and anticipate what the player is going to do when they actually play through that like with the demo did you find that people were doing things that were just completely off the scale of what you expected them to do e not particularly off the scale I, what one thing's been quite nice is i've People seem to get it. People seem to, if they go around the like the scenes that I create have ridiculous number of hotspots in. You can examine loads of stuff on the shelves. There's loads of detail in there. But somehow, people seem to gravitate towards the things that are important. They seem to know, well, I need to use that, and they they kind of go, they sort of scan a room, and go, all right, I can see what's in there. I might try and pick that up and that. Up. Okay, maybe I'll come back to that later. You know, and then they'll go off and they go, right, what can I scan here? Right, and they'll sort of keep this sort of mental log of what they've seen and what's, you know, what's going on. Um, so, in terms of moon logic, so this is something I've sort of thought about, but I don't... Moon logic is just... Isn't isn't necessarily integral to a puzzle. Yeah. It's, in, it's, it's down to the clues that have been given. If you don't give enough clues and the clues aren't sufficient or the clues um, are transient, so they you, you, you give a clue but at then at the beginning of the game and then you can't go back and revisit a similar or, or the same clue again, mm -hmm. then you create a, a, a point where if if you put the game down and two months later you came back to it not remembering, you, yeah. you wouldn't be able to, you'd have to start all over again because you, you wouldn't have remembered all the, the kind of nuances of everything. That, that kind of creates this sort of dead end, creates moon logic. You can have a puzzle that makes no sense, that is yeah. completely bizarre, is completely otherworldly, has items and characters in it that just doesn't, doesn't make any sense, as long as you have ways of tying those together. Um, so when you if you have an item in your inventory that you you don't know what to use it for yet, when you use it with similar things to what it needs to be used for, there needs to be a response that says, oh, you're thinking along the right lines. If you yeah. use it in a way that might be a conventional way, but isn't how you need to go, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not interested in using it like that. A kind of a way of sort of going, oh, okay, just sort of gently nudging the person in the right direction. Yeah. Um, and if you do that at all the touch points, so if there's an item and there's a character and there's an object in the scene, then it would be like a, you know, oh, maybe I should, maybe I should get someone else's opinion. Or maybe I should, you know, or this person over here would say, oh, you know what, I, I, I'm really interested in something. And you go, oh, right, well, they're interested in this object and this object needs to be investigated by something, therefore someone, therefore this is the kind of, this marries the two together. So making sure that there are, any time someone tries to do something, um, that's either very wrong or very right in one way or another, you, you, you're kind of keeping, just reinforcing that. Yeah. Um, and equally, um, uh, I was, was going to make another point, equally I've forgotten it. No idea. It was really, it was really good as well. It was really <laughs> insightful and really great. important. That's all right. Is there anything else you wanted to, to discuss? Anything? No, I've forgotten everything. I don't even know no. who I am. <laughs> No, nothing you wanted to cover? Anything you wanted to advertise? Uh, or... So, uh, the... Which way am I pointing? That way. That way. Over here is... It, you can see the, the demo playing in front of you, uh, and that's, uh, that is free to download from Steam. It is uh, also available on other platforms, but I'm not talking about that here because this is a Steam video. Um, so, uh, that is actually one other thing I wanted to mention is when you were talking about... Um, marketing the game is I wanted to make it available on mobile platforms as well yeah. um, in order to kind of reach that audience and I know it makes it it opens it up to kind of maybe more criticism because it's people who aren't necessarily used to point and click adventures especially on a mobile device um, but I think it, it's because it's got a, a kind of scum interface so it's got these sort of verbs that you can click on it really lends itself to a touchscreen device it's, it's yeah. it, you know the, the publishing it for, for mobile was very, 
very minimal amount of effort required to kind of, it didn't have to rework the interface. It was much more hard work um, adding gamepad support in, which I've, I've added in. Yeah. Um, but that's much less intuitive for point and click because there's no pointing, there's no screen kind of you know, interaction. Um, so yeah, so that's something that I, that I kind of wanted to do. But yeah, no, you can, you can play the demo on Steam. The other thing is the demo itself is, um, it, is it kind of acts like a prequel. Yeah. So it is completely unique puzzles. Um, there aren't any kind of uh, spoilers in the, for the full game, or there aren't any puzzles repeated in the full game. It's not like the first sort of twenty minutes of the of the, of the full game. <clears throat> it's completely different. And where the demo ends, that's where the full game kind of starts as well. So if you play the full game and then you come back and play the demo later on, you'll there'll be a few more kind of little nods and references in there that you might you might kind of get a few in jokes. Um, and, but it's, there's no kind of spoilers either, either way. Um, so, so there's no, nothing, nothing to be, uh, to be lost from, from playing the demo. Go and play it and, uh, add, add Lucy Dream to your wish list. Yeah, I second all of that. It's definitely worth a play, <laughs> for sure. Finish it. I, I quite like that idea of doing a prologue rather than a sort of sample of the actual game as well. I think it's a good way to get people sort of i don't want to say hooked but a good way for them to get them interested and then sort of nudge them into playing a, a, a bigger game i think i think it's a good idea yeah i think a lot, a lot of people don't like playing a demo because they don't want to kind of leave the repetition or they don't want the spoilers yeah um it's not the it's not the first demo i made the first the first demo i made was actually the first part of the full game okay um and when i made it um and tested it it was almost two hours long, um, and and I you know because I I so there's a like I said there's a mechanic in there for creating a sort of so for controlling a dream, and I was I was convinced in myself that the demo needed to at least show that mechanic. It needed to show that you can go into a dream, solve a puzzle, and come back and kind of and have, bring something back and have that sort of interaction between the real world and, and the dream world, um, but in order to tell that story properly, it needed to be much longer. So it, so it was, it ended up being a couple of hours, which was sort of slightly over generous. And then when I saw a few other demos, um, that come out, uh, that were on kind of Kickstarter and as well, I play them and I sort of play them for like 15, 20 minutes and then it's over. You go, and you just like, you're in like one room and you go, Oh, that was it. And it's like, it made me realize that I don't have to kind of, show all my cards right off you know off the bat and it's it's, it's a bit weird people are buying into a, a game which is all about dreaming and in the demo she doesn't do any dreaming <laughs> you know it's, but no one seems to notice everyone just kind of plays it and goes hey that was cool you know oh i wonder i wonder how to, i wonder how the dream's gonna work um so essentially i took those two that two hours of of gameplay and i put them in the bank and they are still the first two hours of gameplay in the full game right. and then a few weeks before the Kickstarter campaign, I basically created a whole new demo because I'd already drawn all the artwork and I had all the um, the character sprites and everything done. It only took a couple of weeks to, to put a, a new demo together, um, and sort of, so all the puzzles I kind of came up with and sort of go well. Actually, if, if she if we wanted to get to the point where she can go to sleep, um, but she can't you know she can't control any dreams or anything. What what do we do there? So it's basically the whole demo just is, is her just trying to get to sleep. Yeah. Um and it's just you know, add add a few few different elements and items in there, making use of some objects that I drawn in the scenes, but they weren't interact they were they were they were just kind of scenery. Go, well actually she she might as well use that. You know, yeah. and it kind of made use of stuff in there that was never was never intended to be used in a game. It's like, oh well, I'll put it in this new demo. Um so that that yeah, that was kind of how I wrapped that up, and then it meant that I then had something that was shorter, sweeter, and completely unique, and it also meant that I didn't. I already had another two hours of gameplay of the full game already started. Yeah. Um. So that seemed like a really sensible and pragmatic thing to do. <laughs> so I did that. No, I mean it worked, didn't it? The prologue, which is the main thing, it seems to leave people wanting to know a bit more about it especially the dreaming thing it's almost like they go oh i've got to figure out what that is so i want to back it and i want to play it when it comes out it's... yeah and i've revealed a kind of couple of screenshots of like the dreams and like when i'm doing my streams of the pixel art 
um, things like people have got an idea of like, oh, this is kind of this is, there's a weird world. I don't, but you know, I don't you know, obviously don't reveal any of the kind of the puzzles and things in there. Yeah. And I'm usually quite careful when I sort of stop a stream. It's like I'm going to stop that there before I start drawing anything that's going to completely ruin that. Um, so yeah, that's 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 where we're at. Excellent. Go and add it to your wish list. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Uh, last thing, the uh, streams. Do you do those? Uh, any? Do you do those randomly, or is there like a schedule for them? There isn't a schedule for them. The best thing to do is probably to follow me on Twitch. I think on Twitch, I'm. Uh, I think my username is just Hardwich, which is my surname, which is H A R D W I D G E. Um, and the other thing to do is go to Lucy-Dreaming.com and go and uh, subscribe to the newsletter. So we don't send out loads of newsletters. It's usually um, a bit of the kind of dev progress, uh, time-lapse videos, uh, screenshots, any events, uh, and, and sort of links to streams and, and other stuff that we're doing. Um, so hopefully it won't be sort of too irritating for people, but you can just go, go and subscribe on there. And then if I, next time I do a stream, I, I usually send an email out anyway. But if you follow me on Twitch, um, you'll get a you'll get a kind of an alert when when I go live anyway. Yeah, perfect.